recently had the opportunity to visit the Historical Aircraft Restoration Society, better known as HARS, in New South Wales, just south of Sydney. There were actually two locations, and we will take you through the second one in a future video. Ian Badham was our guide for the day, and we started the tour outside on the tarmac to look at their P3 Orion. I'm Ian Badham, one of 800 volunteers at HARS Aviation Museum which is operated by the Historical Aircraft Restoration Society. We're based at Shell Harbour Airport uh, between Sydney and Kiama and been operating a bit over 40 years. We have a collection of some 60 aircraft, of which about a third are airworthy. So what makes us a different destination is that people can come down and get on board a number of the aircraft, but also uh, where, where we can, actually see them fly. And so we're a flying aviation museum as well as a static exhibition. Apart from our 747-400 uh, former Qantas aircraft, the largest one we have here at Haas is our Orion. This is an aircraft that was donated to us in 2017. And currently the RAAF have two of them still operating. We are the only museum where our exhibit continues to fly in civilian registration, which is wonderful. And we do get a chance to fly it together with our Neptunes and the Catalina and the Trackers as a flying demonstration, living history of Australia's marine surveillance, submarine hunting capability. So the Orion was the military version of the Electra, which in, uh, back in its day, actually had the same block time, Sydney, Melbourne, as the jets, a very rugged, uh, very capable aircraft. And uh, as one of the uh, former pilots of these uh, used to say to me, here he was as a young pilot flying the Orion, and particularly this one as well, uh, 403 knots, 300 metres above the ocean, 60 degree bank, and us taxpayers paid for him to do that. <laughs> so this particular Orion, uh, was donated to Haas in 2017 after flying some 16,000 hours. 350 of those hours were actually searching in the Indian Ocean for the missing Malaysian 370, MH370. And uh, that's again part of the history. Every aircraft that we have here at Haas has a history, uh, has a capability, has a personality, has a reason for being here. And we love people when they drive here, come by train to the station just opposite us, uh, or, uh, or simply you know, fly in to get involved, to step on board history where they can, to touch and feel, as well as hearing the stories from our tour guides of the working life of these aircraft. So down the working end of the Orion, we have the uh, extra long antenna in the tail. That's the MAD, or Magnetic Anomaly Detection System, which basically allows the operators on board to search for any metal that may be in the ocean. If it's a submarine, then it's a case of dropping the sonar buoys from the uh, positions here into the water to get a triangulation. The sonar buoys uh, uh, went to various depths, some from near the surface, others down to 900 metres and the different thermal layers to be able to track that submarine. Now, all the anti-submarine aircraft had that capability. The Ryan, obviously the most more recent, was really capable with its long range and fast speed. But the Neptunes did the same thing, uh, and as long as well as the tracker that we have here that operated from the aircraft carrier HMAS Melbourne. Ian then took us inside to the first of two hangars to look over their F-111. So the F-111C that we have here at Haas actually started its life as an American Air Force F-111A. And then to replace some of the ones that the Air Force had lost, this came to us and had to be substantially modified with the wings extended by another three feet and a, a much greater uh, undercarriage capability was added to it to allow it to serve with the RAAF. With the RAAF, the F-111s served for 35 years. It was only Australia and the US, which operated this amazingly capability of this aircraft. At Haas, this is the only one that our visitors to a museum can regularly sit in. And this aircraft is actually now owned by our association. 
In fact, as our president said when he signed off on it recently, it's not every day you get to sign to take ownership of an F-111. For a 1960s design, the F-111 was an amazingly advanced aircraft, not just with its swing wing capability, wings straight out for low speed, sweeping back to allow it to operate up to Mach 2.5, but the ejection system allowed not just pilots to try and bail out, but actually the whole capsule at the front of the aircraft would blast off. It was fitted with rocket motor to allow the, uh, allow the, the capsule then to be taken to a greater height and also to wash off the forward speed. Um, parachutes would be deployed uh, using the existing closed cabin until they were down to 15,000 feet, then atmospheric cabin, and uh, had uh, buoyancy as well for survival in the ocean. So a remarkable survivability for pilots with the RAAF. This particular aircraft joined the RAAF from America as a replacement for some of the earlier ones that were lost. And it served in Vietnam. So this aircraft has a war service from Vietnam with the US Air Force before it became an RAAF aircraft. The other side of this is it was actually the last operational F-111 in Australia because the final day uh, of service, a formation flew out from Amberley over Brisbane, came back in and landed. The pilot of this particular aircraft waited for the others to shut down and one minute later he shut the engine on this, the final F-111 to sign off on service after 35 years with the Royal Australian Air Force. Indeed, it was the last operational F-111 in the world because the US Air Force had ceased operation of these aircraft before Australia and then uh, we followed suit. So you, we are literally sitting in aviation history on board this F-111 and our visitors to the museum as part of their tour get the opportunity to experience that history by sitting in the cockpit. At the museum on the day was a former F-111 navigator and weapons systems officer, Phil McDonald, who was involved in the delivery of the first F-111s to Australia. We asked Phil if he wouldn't mind giving us a walk around and tell us about the aircraft. The aircraft was designed in the early 60s. It was quite a remarkable aircraft for its time. With, we didn't have digital then, it was all analogue. And it had some remarkable features. Um, didn't fly till 67. But it was the first to have the swing wing. As you can see, the wings back where they are now, that can do two and a half times the speed of sound. The wings come forward for takeoff landing and they can be in any other position for various speed and uh, altitude requirements. It was quite technologically advanced for its time, particularly again that it was all analogue. It was the first to have the swing wing. It was the first to have an ejectable capsule. In other words, the whole cockpit ejects instead of going out in the seat and that was to protect the crew because it speeds of up to Mark 2.5, two and a half times the speed of sound uh, you wouldn't be comfortable going out in the seat, I don't think. So the first have also train following radar, and that's, a, that's where the aircraft can follow the terrain. There's a selection knob on the centre console, 200, 300, 400, 500, 750 or 1,000 feet. So you can select 200 feet, and you'd be doing 1,100 kilometres hour, 1,100 kilometres per hour normally, maybe, but up to Mark 1.2 with no hands. So it would follow the terrain down through the valleys and over the hills, and that was to avoid radar. In other words, hide behind the hills. There's a great escarpment out here, for instance. You could, one of our targets, simulated targets, was here. And you could hide behind, hide behind that escarpment, <clears throat> and they won't pick you up on radar until you pop up to deliver your weapons. So a lot of very first things. Um, the escape capsule, if it landed in water, it has flotation bags. It has a radio, uh, an antenna comes up, flotation bags, and uh, so it's all designed to protect the crew. We got ours delivered 24 in 1973, and then uh, later, when we, after we lost a couple, they bought four second-hand uh, American F-111As. This is a C. The A's were different in that they had the shorter wing. Uh, Australia, because of the long distances we anticipated, wanted the longer wing like the American Navy version which didn't end up going into production or into service and the FB-111A which was the nuclear strike 
strategic air command as it was called then, aircraft, it had the longer wing and there's a lot of fuel in the wing so it gives you extra range and it also adds to the weight so it needed a stronger undercarriage as well. So our F-111Cs had the longer wing of both the F-111B and the FB-111A and the stronger undercarriage. Okay. Now, as I said before, once we lost a couple, uh, we bought four second-hand F-111As with shorter wings and they actually modified them, extended their wings, put in the stronger undercarriage. You'll see on the undercarriage it says FB-111 and um, that cost a lot of money. They did pour and they said, well, we're not going to do that again. And so this is actually one of those second-hand ones. So even though Australia didn't have them in any conflict, they had them in Darwin, I think, ready for Timor and things, uh, this one had, with the Americans, it served in Vietnam. There's a book on it, uh, on aircraft in Vietnam used by the Americans, and this one is listed as having some battle damage, and there's a couple of patches on the side of the aircraft that, from battle damage it received in Vietnam. When we got them back and formed the first squadron, the CO sat us down, that was 6th Squadron in 1973, and said, these are very controversial, the cost overruns, uh, time delays because of the modifications that were required, a new government in power that cost $20 million, they'll have to last 20 years. Well, they lasted 37 with upgrades, etc. So it's a magnificent aircraft and what a privilege it was to be 24 year old and flying the most technologically advanced aircraft in the world and delivering not only that training in America and bringing them back here. So this is 109, as I said, one of the second-hand ones we bought, and uh, here it is to live in Haas. I mentioned the uh, battle damage. I think that's a patch over some of the battle damage. This one, when it was in American service, got in Vietnam. Remarkable thing about these, another first, which I didn't mention before, was that it was the first to have turbofan engines, that's jet engines with a small fan, uh, with afterburner, which is the afterburner is what's used for supersonic flight and extra takeoff. So one of the great, we were told when we were at, in training over there, and when I went to the factory where they were built, the most costly part of the design was this air intake. Because you can't have supersonic air going into a turbofan, the fan would stall. So this actually is called a a variable inlet spike and it as you go faster it gets fatter it moves back and gets fatter to reduce the amount of air then you've got all those vortex generators to slow the air down so it's not supersonic when it hits the fan that's very briefly but at slow speed you actually need more speed more air sorry so this cowl is a translating cowl it moves forward to get more air in when you're going slow so going very fast we need less air and going slow we need more this is the wing carry through box. This wing will come forward and of course will go out almost out to there. 16 degrees when fully forward. And that's for takeoff and we have leading edge slats and trailing edge flaps. Back, as soon as you're airborne, they sweep them back to 26 degrees, clean it up, bring in the flaps and slats and that's your also your long range cruise wing sweep. And then depending on your speed, the wing sweep can be anywhere from 26 to 72. 72 is where you're going supersonic, two and a half times the speed of sound, and anything in between. This large door here for the undercarriage also serves, while you're airborne, as a speed brake. So it can be lowered without lowering the wheels to slow the aircraft down, and that sort of thing, okay? Very strong undercarriage, as you'll see. Most of the fuel, well, there's a multitude of fuel tanks, but the wing, belly tanks, side tanks, and various other places. Now, because the aircraft doesn't have, it has a swing wing, it doesn't have ailerons. Now, ailerons what aircraft normally use to turn. So this one, the horizontal stabiliser at the back, has to do both jobs of the elevators, which normally used for climb descent, and ailerons are used for turning. They work asymmetrically. So these horizontal stabilise, they're 156 square feet, all on that one pin. Can you imagine when you go and supersonic the pressure on them? And they have to work symmetrically for climbed, climbing and descending and asymmetrically for turning and both asymmetrically and symmetrically at the same time. So that's an unusual feature. We have a various sensors on the aircraft, electronic countermeasures, 
missile approach warning systems, radar homing and warning systems. So these are all systems to detect missiles or radars painting on you and steering missiles at you. And then underneath here we have, we can dispense flares. So if you detect a heat seeking missile coming, you can dispense flares that will drop away, explode at a higher temperature than the engine and the heat seeking missile hopefully will follow it. Otherwise there's chaff in there as well. Chaff is, was around in World War II. That's just aluminium strips. So you've got a cassette about that big. It drops away, explodes 10,000 strips of aluminium to confuse radar and that sort of stuff. You might have seen at air shows on TV or at air shows in person, they have this procedure they call a dump and burn. And that's where they dump their fuel. Not liked by a lot of aircrew, but <laughs> the crowds like it, so they do it. They dump fuel from this port. Even jumbo jets dump fuel if they take, because they can take off heavier than they can land safely for the undercarriage. They dump the fuel out of this point here, and when they light the reheat section of the engine called afterburner, as the fuel is being ejected, it starts to burn and you get a 70 to 80 foot flame. Now this contraption here underneath is called a pave tack. Now when we, did, when we got these in 1973, this is the internal weapons bay, but rarely are weapons carried there. The weapons are normally carried on pylons under the wings, which we don't have any on right now. When we first got it, we had a six barrel Gatling gun in there, 6,000 rounds a minute, 20 millimetre. It had come down on the cage when you wanted it and go back into the bay where there was also an ammunition bin when it's not in use, so you don't have drag. When this technology became available, it's called a pave tack. It's a forward-looking infrared and laser guidance system. And again, that's in the display position. That bear's head-looking thing should be facing down when it's in use. And it can pivot back and forward, you can see, from the, the rings around it. And when not in use, that rolls back in and all you'd see was the little bump, so it's not creating drag. You can highlight the target with a, with a forward-looking infrared and... Uh, lay a laser beam and drop laser guided bombs, so it's quite an advancement. Because <laughs> it was really too big and bulky for it to be a fighter, even though it's called a fighter bomber, it's really a, a bomber. Now that is a capsule that was used in an ejection. I think it's the one that they were still on the ground when they ejected. The ejection's parameters are 0 050, 0 altitude, 50 knots. I believe they were at 90 knots at the end of the runway when they ejected. So the whole capsule ejects, okay? 27,000 pound rocket motor. It's got two nozzles, one facing vertically and one facing aft. And the computers work out with the speed and altitude which nozzle uh, most of the power will go through. Obviously, if you're at 35,000 feet going twice the speed of sound, you don't want the vertical nozzle getting all the power, you just flip over. So that's what it's designed for. Two ejection handles, but whoever pulls the handle, you both go. Um, as soon as the capsule separates, an impact attenuation bag inflates underneath the capsule, and that's about that large. And it's made up of many chambers of air, and that's designed, because this is heavy, and when you land, it's going to be heavy. So that impact attenuation bag, it deflates at a predetermined rate as you as you land to, to break the, the force of the landing. But it's still, I've, a couple of the chaps I know who have ejected said, you ejected about 15 Gs and landed about 20 and you back out for a few seconds. So it is a heavy landing, okay? When they're, if you're on the ground and you eject, the, should, should take, the rocket motor should take you up to about 800 feet. Then the main parachute deploys and down you come, okay? If you're at altitude, when you eject, you don't want the main chute coming out immediately because it would tear itself to pieces. So there's a little drogue chute that comes out. This is designed aerodynamically. It's got a stabiliser stabilizer fin there. So you eject and it's a drogue chute just keeps it steady and it descends to a lower speed. And this here is a barostatic lock. It's a pressure altimeter lock, okay? So when you pass 15,000, the main chute should open and then bring you down, okay, rather than opening at 35,000 and tearing itself to pieces. Now, if it doesn't, what do you do? I mean, you're sitting there, you've ejected, and you're probably having a chat because you've got nothing else to do, picking up the kids after school maybe, 
going for a beer. And then with the standby altimeter is still working. So then you notice you pass 15,000 and the chute hasn't opened. So what to do? Don't worry, you can do it yourself. Okay, there's a backup. So it's a very good system. And uh, as I said, there's a couple of people I've spoken to who have survived the ejection quite well. Anything else we've got here? As I say, terrain following radar, a switch there. The other interesting thing here, now I got out after I was on them a couple of years, so over the next 20 years, um, 25 plus, they probably introduced new procedures, but when I was on them, that seat over there where I sat is as a navigator weapon systems officer. You've still got a control column and throttles, okay? So all we were taught is that in case the pilot got taken out, you, you low level, the birds were a big problem, okay? If he got taken out by a bird, or he got shot or had a heart attack, all we were trained to do was to recover the aircraft, get it to a safe area and height for ejection, okay? Not to land it. Now, whether that changed later when, uh, as they advanced over the 37 years, I don't know. But that's all we were trained to do. The reason it has two control columns is, we were told that in America, where we trained, was it was originally designed for two pilots. So they'd get a pilot who'd been on pilot's course for 12 months, and they say, you're going to sit in that right-hand seat for 12 months and before you can fly in the left-hand seat. Now over there, there's a lot of equipment. There's electronic countermeasures, there's bombing systems, there's radar systems, there's navigation systems. An awful lot to learn. Now these guys have just spent 12 months learning to fly. They're not interested in learning all that stuff. All they want to do is sit over here and fly it. So that wasn't working, so they took them out, put navigators in and called them weapon systems officers. And that's the course I did in America, was called that at Nellis Air Force Base. So I'm very pleased that happened because I got to sit there. But they left the control columns and the throttles and all that. So what we do normally to practice those unusual attitudes and then was after the the last part of a, an exercise, we'd bomb, drop bombs at Evans Head Range. Then on our way back to Embley Air Force Base, we'd book 4,000 foot of airspace, normally 20 to 24,000 with Brisbane Control. Then the pilot would say to me, pull your visors down, close your eyes, and he'd turn it upside down and point it to the ground and say, recover. And there were standard recovery procedures, which even people in light aircraft would know. Sick full forward and centered, rudders neutral. And then if it's upside down, you flip it up the right way, and you fly to a safe area at altitude for ejection. So that was about it. So a beautiful aircraft. When you consider that I'd previously been on the Neptune you saw out there, then the Canberra, and then, the, well, this was the Rolls-Royce, obviously. So it was uh, quite a remarkable thing to be involved in. Okay, I think that's about it. As I say, following the terrain was often a problem when the pilots I flew with had flown Mirages, Sabres, Mirages, uh, then F4 Phantoms. And for them to sit there, not touching this control yoke, a lot of them got twitchy because they, they're used to control the aircraft. But at 200 feet, as I say, 11, 1200 kilometres an hour, and they're not allowed to touch that. So they get a bit fidgety sometimes. So it was a bit of a change of the whole the philosophy of flying for them. A remarkable aircraft though. When Phil had finished talking to us about the F-111, Ian continued the tour in this first hangar. Every aircraft here at Haas Aviation Museum has a story attached to it. The story for Grumman Tracker 851 is remarkable. And it was when the artist was coming down to do his uh, preparation for this painting that we discovered the history which was in June of 1981, with the HMAS Melbourne and the HMAS Torrens were on patrol in the South China Sea off Vietnam. This particular aircraft, 851, took off on the last patrol flight of the day and in the gloom of the distance saw some smoke. The crew investigated, found a refugee boat with 99 people on board, smoke coming from it and sinking. The 99 on board knew they were going to die, so they told the rescuers. The ships, or the, the boats from the Melbourne and the Torrens 
went out and rescued the 99, which is why they became known as the MG99, the Melbourne Group 99. Some went to Singapore to live, 77 came to Australia and settled largely around Sydney. With the artists doing this uh, drawing and then our members here reaching out, we actually held a reunion luncheon here at Haas where the 77 survivors who settled in Sydney, their families, their kids, their grandkids, for the first time met the people from the Torrens and the Melbourne who rescued them. To say that it was an emotional reunion is indeed an understatement, all because of the work that the crew did on the Melbourne and the Torrens in rescuing those 99 who otherwise would have perished in rescuing the 99 off the South China Sea, off Vietnam, in June of 1981. Work is underway to return these two vampires to operational condition. 637 will be flying and the other will be uh, a taxiing capability. The vampires were developed in Britain in 1943 and actually have a timber fuselage, like the mosquito, laminated timber. Back in those days, metal in short supply, lots of trees, uh, lots, lots of people able to, uh, to work with timber and these particular ones we have here at Haas were trainers. They were built by de Havilland at Bankstown. So we have an Australian built capability which served with the RAAF during the uh, 50, or 50s and right into the 60s. This is being restored to at least operate and be able to taxi. It has more of the original um, uh, gear in the nose and compare that to the one that uh, uh, the boys are, re are returning to, to flying capability, which has uh, newer and more compact uh, equipment in the nose. So here at Haas, we continue the great aviation tradition of always improving as we move along, even with aircraft that are set in historic role. The Navy version of the Vampire was the Sea Venom. And this particular one served with the Navy for many years and then uh, was uh, broken up. And when it arrived here a couple of years ago, was in a uh, container, was rusty. The biggest piece was about that size. So the guys here had the best jigsaw puzzle of all time, putting this back together to be on display for our visitors. I have a personal connection with looking at the, uh, the sea venom because I saw, as a school kid, saw a formation flight over Sydney Harbour where two touched wings. One recovered and flew back to Nowra and the other one plunged into Sydney Harbour, the pilot parachuted out using the Martin Baker ejection seat. And in fact, the first jet aircraft to have the Martin Baker was the Vampires, developed in Britain, and Martin Baker are used by many, many of the air forces around the world, the US Navy and most of the European air forces. Looking magnificent in our hangar number one here at Haas, is the Mirage, the Mirage which replaced the Sabre as Australia's frontline fighter. The Air Force needed a greater capability and so the Mirage were purchased initially virtually off the shelf from Dassault and meant that the Australia had a capability to uh, operate up to Mach 2.2, uh, 60,000 or so feet. It was a, a vast improvement from the days of the Sabre and before that the Vampire and the Meteor. There were other civilian aircraft in the hangar, but we decided to press on to the second hangar where there was a much larger collection of military aircraft to see. So here at Haas Aviation Museum, we have three Neptunes. 273 in the dark blue, served with number 10 squadron in Townsville for a long time, moved into private ownership has been a mainstay of our operations here at Haas. And part of the, the story is that without 273, we may not have acquired the super constellation, Connie, which is part of our uh, fortune to have here as one of the few in the world, uh, or in fact, the only super Connie in the world still flying, and also helped us get the 747-400 into here. It was because our guys were in the 
aviation boneyards in the States looking for parts for this blue Connie that they found the uh, Lockheed Constellation and the rest is history to have Connie flying and also to get the 747-400 into this small airport, the pilots who flew it in came down and spent a couple of days doing touch and goes in the Neptune to get the feel of a runway that was far narrower and far shorter than what they're used to flying. The Neptune was marine reconnaissance. Like the Catalina we have here from the World War II era, uh, the Neptune operated in the late 50s through the 60s and 70s and re replaced by the Orion that we have here as well. It had a remarkable uh, anti-submarine capability with the MAD system, the big fiberglass bubble under the uh, belly and the uh, long antenna sting in the, in the tail to look for metal and uh, then to drop sonar boys to try to detect uh, where, it wa where the submarine might have been. Also had a, a sniffer on the nose which took samples of the air to see if there was any, um, any, any diesel fume left the submarine may have dived down. And then it was a matter of putting the sonar boys out to try to triangulate where the sub could be. And these aircraft were equipped with depth charges and torpedoes to finish the job. The power plant on the Neptune is the 3350, the same as on the Constellation, a piston engine. And the RWF, like other air forces, found that if you fueled the aircraft to its maximum patrol capability, then loaded it with 11 crew, then all the ordnance. On a hot summer's day, it was very difficult to actually take off uh, through lack of power. So most of the air forces, in addition to the piston engines, also fitted the Westinghouse auxiliary jets. Normally, the pistons run on petrol, jets run on kerosene. Because they are an afterthought, then all here run on petrol but they were so thirsty that, as, that they were on for takeoff. As soon as they were airborne, then the jets would be shut down for the duration of the flight and only put back on again, um, coming into land in case a go around was required. An interesting side note is that a Westinghouse jet of these were what a guy called Ken Warby uh, put on his tinny, well, a bit more than that, um, and uh, set the water speed record, world water speed record on Blowering Dam near Tumut in the Snowy Mountains, 511 kilometres an hour. So strap that in your tinny and see how fast you can go. So the Westinghouse jets give the Neptune that extra grunt for takeoff. And it's beautiful to watch uh, an aircraft operating where it's turning with a radial engine and it's burning with the jet engines. So turning and burning is what sets the Neptune apart. The Australian CA-27 Sabre developed from the American F-86 Sabre. To enter service with Australia, at the time, uh, the Air Force wanted a more capable aircraft and really liked the American F-86. The Prime Minister of the time, Menzies, liked things British. He was looking for the Hawker Hunter. It was a compromise. We got the Sabre, was built in Australia as the CA-27, at CAC in Melbourne. The compromise was that they fitted the Avon jet engine, the British Avon uh, jet engine, which then allowed our Sabre to be faster than the American Sabre. The Americans initially had machine gun on the wings. Ours was built with a 30 millimeter cannon. So we could outfly and outshoot the American Sabre. It was also the first aircraft in Australia when it entered service in the early 50s to break the sound barrier. And in fact, as a kid, I remember going to air shows at Richmond and watching the Sabre and hearing the pilot do the commentary back to the PA system saying he's got up to 20,000 feet and then put it in a dive and then you hear the bang, bang as it broke through the compression of the sound barrier. The Air Force did it for two shows and then stopped. They said they couldn't afford uh, to keep demonstrating the sound barrier breaking because of the damage to the tomato glass houses around the Richmond Air Force Base and car windscreens. But as a kid, I was lucky enough to, to hear it and see it. We have four Dakota DC-3 C-47 
aircraft here at Haas Aviation Museum at Shell Harbour, three airworthy, one being restored to flying again. The one here, A6594, has a remarkable history because back in 1963, it flew the first RAAF flight into South Vietnam to fly supplies from Butterworth, from the RAF base, into Saigon and continues to fly. We also have two de Havilland Caribou here, one of which, 234, flew the last operational flight for the RAAF in Vietnam. So we have a bookend for the total RAAF deployment history flying here at Haas with the Dakota 94 and the Caribou 234. This particular one, which is in DC-3 configuration, was built in 1942 at Santa Monica in California, one of some 16,000 of the type constructed during World War II. At the time this came off the production line in 1942, it was expected to have a service life of about three months, but yet still flying. Part of the history of this aircraft, which started off with the US Army Air Force in the South Pacific, then to the RAAF, was that in 1946, the Australian government started an airline called Trans-Australian Airline. And this particular DC-3 flew the first passenger flight for TAA from Melbourne to Sydney, a time of two hours, 50 minutes. Very different to today's one hour uh, flights in a jet. The DC-3 first flew in 1935 and was the first almost all metal airliner with a rounded fuselage. It set the standard for aviation, uh, which previously had fabric aircraft with largely square designs, uh, and set the standard for what is modern aviation today. There are many DC-3s still flying. After World War II, a number of airlines looked to, uh, to replace the DC-3. A lot of search went into things like Convairs, or drovers, other aircraft to replace a DC-3. The reality is nothing has ever replaced a DC-3 or a Dakota C-47. Nothing has ever replaced it except another one. About 90 of these were built. The Scottish Twin Pioneer, the last British built radial engines from the late 50s into the 60s, served with the RAF, Malaysian Air Force, and a number of Asian Air Forces. It had a Stole capability that was way better even than a caribou with its ability to land almost like in creek beds, uh, so particularly during the Malaysian emergency, supporting troops and, and activities there. Then used by a number of survey and construction firms around the world because of that capability. This one was donated to Haas fairly recently, flew in here and is airworthy. The last airworthy Scottish twin pioneer in the world. A, a helicopter pilot mate of mine, Dan Tyler, reckons it's the ugliest contraption that ever flew. His particular story was as a newly arrived uh, uh, Huey pilot in Vietnam. He was doing a night patrol near the uh, Laos border and radar picked up that he was being followed by an unidentified aircraft. In the moonlight, he saw this strange shape uh, silhouetted and was unable to get permission to fire on it. He tried everyone, nobody would give him permission. It was only 20 years later at Bankstown when he saw a similar one that another friend of his said, ah, oh, that's, a, that's a twin pin, a Scottish twin pioneer. And Dan said, I'm pretty sure that's what I was following me uh, in the night around, uh, around Vietnam that night. And the guy said, yes, the CIA had four of them doing all sorts of interesting stuff out of Laos. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good story. On the apron outside the second hangar were a number of other aircraft for us to look at and explore inside like this Neptune. And the Canberra was also free for us to look inside. We then went back inside to hear from Professor Michael Howe about some of the Navy aircraft at the museum. Well, I'm Michael Howe. I'm the project leader of the Navy Heritage Flight for Haas. And uh, the quick background of the uh, NHF, as we call it, is that about... Uh, Approximately 20 years ago, the Navy decided that it would not continue to run its own historic flight. 
they contacted a number, number of organisations, including Haas, and we proposed that we get them loaned so that we could look after them and if the Navy wanted to get them back. Quick answer was they decided they didn't want to do that. They put them up for open advertising. Haas bid along with other historic aviation museums. And the outcome was that about four years ago, we officially acquired 11 airframes from the Navy and we've since supplemented them with a, with a couple of others. Also added recently, the RAAF has, have given us a uh, Huey, an H model, uh, 702, uh, sorry, 703 code. And uh, basically that adds to the two Navy Hueys that we also acquired. So at the moment, we fly a number of them. Uh, we've got the Grumman Tracker 844, which is behind me as, as I speak. That flies regularly. Uh, it's in active service. We also fly a uh, B model Huey uh, 898 and it flew yesterday for example in, in the uh, local uh, area. So we're very proud of the fact that we can actively support people with operational airframes rather than just say, we've got some nice aircraft and come to Haas and have a look. Uh, our next project is the little Oster, uh, which is the Admiral's Barge Liaison Aircraft. And uh, we're in the final stages of registering that to fly. So within a, probably six months, we'll have Operational Huey, Operational Tracker, Operational Oster, uh, after that, second Huey, and after that, a third Huey, because we find the Hueys are much more good, uh, appropriate for community events. You can land them, people can look at them, whereas the tracker overflies at a thousand feet, and within a couple of minutes you think, oh yeah, it's gone. So, um, so look, in summary, the Navy, uh, we call it the Navy Heritage Flight, because um, the, if we use the term Royal Australian Navy in any setting, it can be withdrawn by the Chief of Navy or approved by the Chief of Navy individually. And we just don't want to enter that bit of debate. So we call it the Navy Heritage Flight. Uh, but as you can see, we leave Navy on the aircraft and we brief the Navy fully as to what we're actually doing. So that's the quick background of the, the Haas Navy Heritage Flight. Well, behind me is a little uh, Navy uh, Oster, and these were essentially called Admiral's Barges because they were used for liaison and uh, basically travel between you know, Navy bases. And in the Navy, anything that carries an Admiral is called a barge. So whether it's an air, a cr aircraft, a car or a, or a boat, it's an Admiral's Barge. Uh, this is, these were made in England, um, the Oster Company. Uh, it technically is a four-seater, uh, but it's very cramped and very crowded. And uh, they were essentially the, the utility aircraft that the Navy used in the 1950s. And uh, the Oster is probably best known on the East Coast as one of these aircraft actually took off with no pilot from Sydney, uh, Kingsford Smith, and flew over Sydney uh, unmanned for a period of time until it was shot down by the by the Australian Defence Force. So uh, basically the, the Oster is a notoriously interesting little aircraft simply because this was um, the, the uh, subject of considerable concern for an hour and a half or so over Sydney when, uh, because essentially they don't have a starter motor and so the pilot has to literally set the throttle and hand start by swinging the prop. And that particular pilot set the throttle too far and when it kicked off, it literally took off with no one in it. So um, it's probably the main claim to fame of the Oster uh, is that it created that, uh, that scene over Sydney for um, a, you know, a couple of interesting hours back in the 50s. So this one uh, is very close to Airworthy and we are at, the, at this time, and we're doing this in October 2023, uh, we're just ready to apply for it to have Airworthy status and be approved for flying. So it's virtually airworthy and we're waiting for the paperwork for it to be able to be legal and fly. Well, this is a Wessex uh, anti-submarine uh, helicopter. It was the first significant helicopter that the, uh, the Navy operated 
and it had two basic roles. Early on it was fitted for anti-submarine, uh, but for the bulk of their life they removed the anti-submarine capability and essentially it was a troop carrier uh, or, a, or a load shifter, like moving from shore to a ship or equivalent. Uh, it was used extensively by the special forces in uh, Malaya and uh, Korean campaigns. It's a British helicopter, but it's an American design. So the Wessex was really a Sikorsky built under license. And as you can see, they were often allocated to a ship. This one was allocated to HMAS Success. And as such, it was allocated to the ship. Uh, that is no longer the practice, but when this was operating, that was the practice of the Navy. And that's why the name of the ship is actually written on the front of the helicopter, because it was a dedicated airframe. Uh, what's unusual about it is that if you have a look, the pilots could only access by the little external handhelds and ladders that take them up and you can't get from the internal carriage area, meaning where the troops and cargo is, you can't actually get up to the flight crew there because if you can see where there's a flap open, that's the jet engine that actually drives the turbo shaft and the shaft goes up between the two pilots so the obvious space where you think you could get internally from either the cockpit to the, the luggage space or, or carry area isn't true. So if you have a look, you can see there's a number of little small, literally clamber holes because access to the uh, cockpit is only external. And they had to climb in, climb out in all weather and in all conditions uh, outside the aircraft. So uh, classic British design. And uh, the other thing that we laugh about is that they're actually made of uh, a metal that reacts with seawater. So if this aircraft uh, crashes and goes into the sea, the airframe literally begins to dissolve because the metal interacts with the seawater. And they were designed to have flotation devices. Uh, the little wheel here has a, you can see the silver thing attached to it. That's actually a small balloon that is meant to inflate and be and carry it on top for a period of time in the optimistic hope that they could put a crane on the top and lift it up and put it back on the ship. Otherwise, the airframe dissolves in contact with seawater. So that's the jet engine, which literally goes up between the two pilots, co-pilot. It then has a differential that turns into, it, it into vertical. So that's a little jet engine. And then when you have a look inside, it's actually got quite a spacious uh, cargo and troop carrying capability. So it's an excellent exhibit from our point of view because um, if people want to climb up and sit in the cockpit, it's fully instrumented. If people want to sit in the back, like a special air service or equivalent, it's a very robust airframe and there's very little damage they can do. So we're happy that they do it. Uh, this is a, a Navy C-47. Uh, most people call them Dakotas. When they were in military service, they had a double door and they were called C-47. When they were in civilian service, they had a single passenger door and they were called a Dakota. Otherwise, they're virtually identical apart from the internal fit out. This one was originally an RAAF Dakota and it had the prefix A65 and then its particular number. And the Navy acquired four RAAF C-47s and as you can see, the Navy uses a different designation. It calls them N290. They're officially called an RF4. So the Navy even had its own designation, didn't even call them C47. So you wonder why people shake their head about you know, naming aircraft. Uh, basically, this one flew in uh, RAF service for many years. It was then acquired by the Navy and the Navy used it as a navigation trainer. So it's got a very unique cockpit fit out so as usual pilot, co-pilot, but then when you look behind, when you take some interior shots, you'll see that they've got three navigator training uh, layouts. And in that sense, it's quite unique. Very few of the C-47s ever had that arrangement internally. The other unique feature is that this carried the Queen in the Royal Tour in 1954. It was technically an RWF Dakota in 1954 but we were outraging everyone by having it as a Navy Dakota claiming it carried the Queen because the interior is fitted out for the Queens, but the exterior, it finished its life as a Navy N290. And in that sense, it's a Navy RF4. 
uh, for all those who love technical claims as such. It's one of the lowest airframe air Dakotas or C-47s that are in Australia and our long-term aim is to restore it to flying because it's, had, it's only got something like 6,300 hours on it, which is a very, very low airframe use for a C-47. So what people I think enjoy about this one is the interior because we've refurbished it to how the RAAF had it when they flew the Queen in 1954. And the other unique feature of it is it's got a door which has a half door. It's the only C-47 ever having that door that we're aware of. And that's in case the Queen landed but did not have time to get out and actually speak to people on the ground. So they could open the door and she could wave appropriately out to the adoring crowd or whatever the term was. And this is the only C-47 that has that arrangement because it's been retained. So it's a pretty unique aircraft, and more importantly, it's an aircraft that people can get into and look at and enjoy, rather than a lot of them because they're combat type aircraft, they're really difficult for the public to get into, or perhaps only one or two could get into them at any given time. So this is a very popular exhibit, airframe, and it is part of the Navy Heritage Flight. Essentially, the aircraft is divided into two sectors, this rear sector is where all the support crew, presumably the ADCs and the adjutants and the Royal Party officialdom, they all sat back here. But in this middle section, this is where the special compartment was obtained for the Queen. This is the Queen's seat and you can see on the wall there is a special uh, stewards button and crew button where the Queen could seek assistance. Um, it's the only C-47 that has 240 volt power in case she needed to have a hairdryer. So this whole aircraft was rewired for, for 240 volt power. You can see the ordinary power point above the Queen's seat. So from here back, this is um, the Queen's compartment. The rear compartment was for her support crew. And the other unique feature that I mentioned is that if you come forward, you can see that the Navy actually divided it up into navigator training, uh, air crew training, and it flew in the Navy essentially as a trainer of air crew. So it has the ordinary C-47 cockpit but in commercial service, this would have been a space for tea, coffee, stowing air, uh, passengers' clothing, uh, like coats and so on. Whereas this particular one is configured for navigator training. And in that sense, it's also a very unique C-47. So it's an interesting combination of history, uh, technical training and an unusual layout. And I repeat, in that sense, it's a very unique aircraft and it's a popular one for people to visit as part of the Navy Heritage Flight. Well, this is a Haas Catalina. Uh, it's technically what's known as a PBY-6. The Australian Air Force actually flew PBY-5As, but when we went looking for a Catalina, this was the one that was available. Uh, it was found in Portugal. It was a, uh, essentially a, a bomber that delivered water. So it became a, a firefighting aircraft in Portugal. When they finished it operationally, they just beached it in Portugal. And so Haas, with the cooperation of the uh, flying boat uh, enthusiast crews, basically sent crews to Portugal, got it airworthy and flew it back. That's the simplest version of how we acquired it. It was actually built just at the end of World War II and peace was declared when this aircraft was actually delivered which meant it became war surplus and was just sold off. And that's how it ended up being a water bomber uh, in Portugal. We've repainted it and refurbished it to look like the Royal Australian Air Force PBY-5As. We had 156 of these in World War II. They were based at Lake Boga in Victoria, which was the flying boat heavy maintenance base. But the main operational base in the uh, East Coast was Rathmines, just on Lake Macquarie and uh, there's a very young Air Force cadet. I actually flew in one of these at, um, at Rathmines in the 50s because they were still operational then. The one that you can see behind me is an amphibian. 
which is a very rare version of the Catalina. Uh, most of them were like speedboats. If you wanted to bring them up onto the land for maintenance, you just used a trailer, a really big trailer, like you know, when you see a speedboat being put on a trailer to come back up. Whereas this one has wheels. And the purpose of the PBY 5A amphibians was that they're allocated to each squadron as air sea rescue. So that if an aircraft crashed at sea or a, there was a rescue at sea, hopefully the sea was smooth enough that one of these could go out, land on the sea with the wheels up, rescue whoever needed to be rescued, and then fly back to an air base. In other words, they needed the wheels to land uh, because they're essentially delivering people from a bad situation to hospital or wherever. So it's very convenient that it was an amphibian because um, basically flying boats have disappeared. We now use water for recreation and you know, the idea of Rose Bay being reserved for Catalinas and Sunderlands, for example, in Sydney is just no longer technically feasible. So it's a very valuable aircraft. If you have a look, there are some photographs of it where we've uh, done touch and goes on Lake Illawarra. We have taken it up to Rathmines and landed it on Lake uh, Macquarie and put it on display at the annual air show up there. So it's been used to promote you know, the history of this particular type of aircraft. They were called black cats because they're all painted black and Catalina. And on the nose, there's a very popular uh, 50s cartoon figure called Felix the Cat. So if you have a look on the nose, you can see the symbols of all the squadrons that operated the Catalinas. And the little white cat there is Felix because this one is known as Felix the Cat. Um, they had armament. So if you have a look at the front, you'll see a, a, a turret for 303 machine guns. And if you choose to go to the rear of the aircraft, they have two blister turrets where they had 0.5 Browning machine guns. And although we've not fitted them, they also had a downward firing 303 machine gun at the rear of the hull. So in very simple terms, this is a boat that flies. And uh, the Catalinas were very, very popular in the sense of how effective they were. And very unfortunately, the Japanese executed Catalina crews on capture. So the people who flew these aircraft, in my opinion, were not only enormously tough people because they literally flew them. There was no automatic, and these flew 17, 18 hour patrols. They had unmuffled uh, engines. Most of them ended up deaf because they had no ear protection. And they knew that if they were captured, they would be executed. So we pay a great deal of tribute to the Catalina crews. And this one is repainted as the Catalina that one of our Haas pilots used to fly. So it's particular insignia numbers commemorate uh, this particular Haas member who has now unfortunately died. His name was Rhys Hughes and this Catalina is painted in memorial of the work of Rhys Hughes. So it's a fascinating aircraft and, uh, and, and people really enjoy watching it take off and land, uh, particularly on the water. And there are some photos next to it showing you where it actually does that. So this is a PBY6 Catalina repainted as a Black Cat PBY-5A. There were many other aircraft for us to look at, including a Boeing 747 jumbo jet, but we had run out of time. We will leave you with a short montage of some of these aircraft as we thank Ian and all of the team at the Haas Museum for such a wonderful visit.